become a member. Sign in and start streaming today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the June 12, 2020 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Kazuti. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a huge show, a lot of things to get to. So let's get started. Let's get started with a quick take on the 22-week abortion ban proposal officially making the ballot this week. Patty Cahoon from Westward, with all the back and forth that the whole signature process had to go through, the fact that it's made the ballot so that the voters of Colorado can decide seems like it's uh, at least a positive thing for the process. What did you think about that making the, the, the ballot this week? Well, you're right that it'll be more, it'll be better for people that they get to vote on it rather than fight over whether or not it should have made the ballot, whether there was a bad process during the COVID-19 petition gathering. But Coloradans have had a chance to vote on this before. First state to legalize abortion in the country. I think Coloradans have said what they wanted to say and they will say it again in November. David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. Uh, 2020 has been wacky is an understatement, but trying to get ballot proposals to the ballot with signatures and everything else, this had the potential of kind of being left out in the cold because of a technicality. Uh, it seems that if at least voters have an opportunity to decide that all is well, but maybe I'm being a little too optimistic. What do you think? Well, th this is an example actually of how things are haven't changed that much in, in 2020. I looked uh, at the Gallup poll, uh, which has been asking questions for a quarter century about the, this, these kinds of uh, proposals. And the, the results have actually been, been quite steady uh, in American public opinion. For the first sem semester of pregnancy, uh, over 60% of the American public say that, that abortion should generally be legal in that period. For the second trimester, the people who say abortion should generally be legal are it's about 24 to 28 percent you know that's a fairly narrow range over a quarter century of opinion polling and then for the third trimester no more than 14 percent and often less say that that abortion should generally be legal in the third trimester so even in colorado which as patty says has a long record as a pro-choice state i think that this initiative does have some chance of passing Eric Sonman, political uh, uh, analyst and a weekly columnist with Colorado Politics. Uh, Eric, for me, regardless of what happens to the actual results of the ballot, the fact that it got there feels like a whew moment for uh, Governor Polis because he has to fight a lawsuit that his rules, which helped every other ballot proposal, but not this one because of a timing situation, uh, it, it seems like at least a breath of relief for him. What do you think? Well, it might be a breath of relief from that angle, Dominic. On the other hand, obviously, he'll be part of the opposition uh, to this to this measure. Good for the proponents of this measure for getting it on the ballot. When they first submitted, they were roughly 10,000 signatures short. They had a cure period. The cure period was right, in the, right during the height of the, of the COVID epidemic of stay at home and all the rest. They still managed to come back in, not just with the 10,000 signatures they needed to cure, but with somewhere in the 40 to 50,000 signature ballparks. They worked very, very hard. Uh, I do think there's a shift going on. It's a slight shift. It's a subtle shift in public opinion respect, with respect to second and particularly third trimester abortions. We'll see if that shift is enough to carry this one over the finish line. I still think they have an uphill battle on their hands. Right on our panel today, Lucille Wenegema, a communications consultant with Cleo's Creative. Great to have you on the panel, Lucille. Uh, your thoughts on this making the ballot? Sure, if we're talking about the process of making it on the ballot, obviously COVID has thrown all of our sort of natural processes out of whack. And so I, I completely agree that uh, the process of getting it on, on the, the ballot for voters, uh, I, I think Jared Polis is definitely a judge of bullet there, um, no, no pun intended. And so 
when we're thinking about whether or not it'll pass, whether or not Coloradans uh, still believe that uh, abortion is is a medical procedure, uh, it's medical health that that people should have access to, uh, we'll definitely see. Colorado's a leader, as uh, Patty started to sort of tell us here, six years before uh, the Roe v. Wade decision, um, we as a state decided that that was a form of healthcare that we wanted to provide people. And that's a, a version of healthcare that we provide lots of people that are even outside, coming in from outside of Colorado. Um, and it, so it's something that we know that people need, that people continue to want to seek out. And so I, I think it, it, it'll be super interesting to see what Coloradans actually uh, feel about sort of this parsing of, of the law here. Uh, but I, I expect that uh, Coloradans will still err on the side of expanded health care here. Let's get to it. It's been a big week. John Hickloop and Andrew Romanoff faced off in their first head-to-head -head debates this week during their CBS4 Colorado Sun and PBS12 debate a debate that you can watch right here on this channel at 9 p.m. later tonight. Both candidates addressed various issues. John Hickleber received questions about uh, his ethics investigation, and Andrew Romanoff doubled down on his support of the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. Uh, Patty, we'll go to, free, to you for this one. Um, it's been a pretty sleepy campaign until this week. We have debates. We actually have people talking about this. We have the candidates. What were your thoughts? Well, my first thought is we should quit filming at 11 o'clock on Friday because last week all the action happened right after this show in the ethics hearing for Hickamooper, who did finally show, who did not acquit himself well at all. It would have been so great if he had just been dealt with it early, he said maybe I did something wrong, I didn't think so, who does understand 41, but this hemming and hawing and this trying to avoid showing up before the hearing was not good. It's not good for his candidacy. It's not really good for his image because one of the things Hickenlooper has always been is seen, he seemed unplugged and maybe unpracticed and we've liked that. In this case, I have to say with debates, all the joy goes out of watching people if they're not one-on-one. -on -one. When you're virtual, you just don't get the same amount of energy really from either of those candidates. I think they laid out their positions pretty well, but you don't feel that everyone, anyone is going to be really excited going to the poll on June 30th or mailbox on June 30th. David, I know as a debate producer and moderator, I love to think that the entire electorate is watching debates and making their decision there, but I know it's not true. Um, but you can get enough headlines from an ethics investigation and some debates where you can at least make what would have been not so tight of a race, a tighter race. From what you've seen from the ethics investigation and the debates, uh, do we have a race here? Well, we'd certainly have a race if people were uh, strive to be uh, well-informed citizens, such as by watching debates on educational television like uh, PBS 12 or by reading uh, newspaper coverage of them. Uh, sadly, a lot of people don't. And so that that's Romanoff's uh, perhaps a, a Achilles heel is that he's winning the debates. Uh, but how many people are, are noticing that? You know, more, more generally, I think when you have two good people who are applying for a job, like Hickett, Looper, and Romanoff applying for the Senate job. Often people say that the best thing to do is hire the person who wants the job the most. And here that, that that's clearly Andrew Romanoff, who, who does have a, a very successful background as a legislator, whereas Hick and Looper's been successful, but on the uh, executive side. And, and my prediction is that whether or not John Hickenlooper wins this Senate seat, he will not serve six years as a U.S. Senator, because if there's a Democratic president in the next six years, he'll end up in, in the cabinet. And, and he does have the experience to be executive experience to be a good cabinet secretary. Eric, when I saw, when the, I saw debate, the debate, I saw uh, uh, two candidates that were very on brand. Um, Andrew Romanoff doubled down with what he was talking about. He was not looking for any sort of centrist policy. He's going to be the progressive candidate and not worry about it. And John Hickelooper was the guy who's never really polished on the stump, but tells you stories about different things that are going on, but that's his brand. What did you see in the debates? Usually you and I see it pretty similarly, Dominic. I'm gonna take a slightly different take here. Uh, Hickenlooper's brand is one of being so genuine, of being fresh, of being different. I didn't get that coming across at all. In the presidential debates that Hickenlooper was a part of, no, he didn't light it up. But man, in, the, in these two debates this week, one of which you, Dominic, were a part of, it's not only that he didn't like it up, light it up, 
he barely seemed there. He barely seemed interested. He certainly has, it seems like he's lost his fastball if he ever really had a fastball. For Romanoff, yes, he's very on brand circa 2020, but the problem with Andrew is whatever race he runs in, the brand seems to change. When he was running against Mike Kaufman, I guess six years ago now, it was very much of a centrist brand. Now he's trying to be the Ocasio Cortez. Bernie Sanders true believing progressive brand and I think it is hard for him to shift his brand as much as he uh, as, as he tries to do it. I have yet to really bump into a, a Democratic consultant or somebody who really follows uh, these races closely internal to the party who thinks Romanoff has a chance. I agree with David that if you look at the empirical evidence, Andrew wants it more, is waging a much more aggressive campaign, but it is hard to see how Romanoff overcomes the odds that are against him. And Hickenlooper, for all his sort of lackadaisicalness about the whole thing, probably has his ticket, not entirely punched, but largely punched to Washington, D.C. Uh, a few months from now. Lucille, as you look at this, Democrats in Colorado uh, went with Bernie Sanders. There is a progressive wing that's pretty powerful in Colorado, but the state is not that progressive. The state is pretty purple. We've split our tickets before, even though that we were part of the blue wave in 2018. Uh, it's, it's not that way. How do you see this race going down, seeing that we only have a couple of weeks before we know exactly who wins this primary? Well, what we're really looking at here is two separate things, right? We're talking about delivery, we're talking about personality, execution, and then we're also talking about the issues. And as much as we like to think that the first set of things isn't important, it is. So if we're looking at the issues first, I think Andrew Romanoff is on top of everything, he is really nailing the moment. Um, he is speaking really clearly about his role um, as a, a congressional member, uh, if, if he were to be elected, what his plans are going to be rather than sort of flexing to his prior records. He's speaking really um, forcefully about what his actions will be. Now, I completely agree. Colorado is still really purple, even if we're looking at, you know, uh, a blue governor's seat and, and Congress right now. But we have to make sure that whoever wins out of this race is able to adequately um, represent the Coloradan interests. And while that is becoming more progressive, I think more than anything, we're also going to go back to that first uh, genre where we're talking about the delivery. And Hickenlooper just hasn't been able to deliver. He waffles quite a bit. Um, he doesn't speak sort of equivocally on, on what his passions are, why he's even in this race, why this particular role is a place for him to be effective. It's sort of just like anything that'll do at this point. So, um, I mean, I still think that Hickenlooper will probably win. Voter, voters are, are interesting that way. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens, particularly as we uh, tackle this uh, COVID Zoom call medium. And remember, that debate is right here on PBS 12 at 9 p.m. tonight. If you're watching this online, you want to watch it online, it's available at pbs12.org, uh, including our partners, cbs4.com uh, and, uh, of course, Colorado Sun. Let's get to our next topic. Black Lives Matter protests continued in Denver this week, and policy responses to the protests have begun to take shape. The state Senate passed a police reform bill by a vote of 32 to 1 on Tuesday, while the Denver police announced that chokeholds will no longer be used and SWAT officers will wear body cameras. Meanwhile, a federal judge ruled in favor of a lawsuit, which changes how the police in Denver decide when to use less lethal weapons. David, we go to you. What are your thoughts on some of the first policy changes that come out as a product of these protests? Well, let's give the legislature uh, credit for the uh, uh, police reform bill, at least in the, in the process. Um, it, it, uh, it passed the Senate, as you said, 32 to 1. And that was in part because John Cook, the assistant minority leader uh, and uh, former three-term sheriff of, of Weld County, uh, was able, he voted against the bill in committee, and then he was able to sit down and work with the sponsors, explain some of the, the problems with, with how they were trying to do things, and, and they listened and, and made improvements in the bill, and, and hopefully will uh, continue in improvements on, on the, the House side, but it's certainly going to pass. Um, you know, one of the things the bill does is it abolishes uh, qualified immunity, uh, which is a judicially created doctrine that, that protects uh, government employees from being personally sued for their, their actions on the job, as long as they're not uh, way out of line with, with existing law. And so my question is, if, if we're going to abolish 
qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. Why do we still have qualified immunity, for example, for, for college administrators, like at the University of Colorado, who knowingly violate student rights? You know, when a, a college dean is making abusive and illegal decisions to, for example, expel a student without due process, they've got plenty of time for reflection. And that, that's a much easier situation for them compared to law enforcement officers who may have to make a split second decision when they themselves are in, in mortal peril. Um, another change in this bill that's going to pass is requiring body cams for all law enforcement officers. And I'll say we, we know from, from national data, one of the biggest effects of that will be to help disprove false allegations against law enforcement officers, which are unfortunately quite common. But an effect that I don't think the sponsors are realizing is it's, all going to, it's also going to massively expand the surveillance state because those body cameras are eventually gonna get integrated with facial recognition. So every time an officer looks your way, your identity and location are gonna be put in a permanent government database. Eric, uh, anytime you see protests of this magnitude, and don't get me wrong, this is unique in the fact that we haven't seen this kind of size really worldwide in protest, uh, really in, in, in recent memory. Uh, but the urge to make some sort of change in policy either comes out of if it's done too fast, sometimes it's too watered down, or it's too knee jerk, and it actually may not be good policy. From what we've seen so far, do you think sound policy is coming out of the protests in Colorado? I think generally, yes. I think your caution is a good one, Dominic. Uh, and Colorado, if I'm not mistaken, I believe is the first state. Some of that just has to do with which legislative legislatures are currently in session, but is the first state to really do this kind of a bill in the aftermath of George Floyd's killing uh, and all the other recent events. On one level, it is sad that it took these recent killings and this kind of a moment and this degree of, of unrest and of protest to bring about some logical changes, for instance, requiring SWAT uh, teams to have their body cameras on, eliminating ch chokeholds in the case of the Denver Police Department, et cetera. But that's apparently what it took. The bill, Senate Bill 217 that we're talking about, it started out with a very, almost a partisan divide in the state Senate, and then it quickly, through some compromise, through some amendments, became something that passed uh, 32 to one, which I think speaks to some common sense prevailing, uh, dealing with the qualified immunity issue in a, in a more responsible way, making sure that police officers who violate all protocols have some skin in the game. They can now be personally liable up to $25,000, but not as much skin in the game as was originally proposed. The lastly, the one measure that, uh, the one piece of the measure that I really like and I'm glad to see included is getting rid of the notion of an innocent bystander as was the case with the three cops who just looked on in the case of George Floyd. Uh, that if you see now police officers, if you see something going awry, you are required to step in and do something about it. I think that's very positive. Lucille, from what we've seen so far in Colorado, are we seeing the right policy changes? And is it laying groundwork for any future needs in uh, different policies that continue to need, to need change? Well, if we're trying to talk about whether or not these policies are the quote unquote right policies, we really have to think about what the role is of police in our society. If we are charging police officers to be well-trained, well-resourced uh, arbiters of our safety, then great. But that is not how police forces have acted. That is not how they've acted when posed with various reform measures of which there have been across the country that are either disregarded or ill-implemented uh, on on various occasions, and they still continue to be funded to be funded at rates that are exponential to the things that actually impact people's lives the most. So when we're thinking about what the role of police is, and whenever we're trying to legislate around police action, that's what we should be doing. The the real thought here is, okay, let's let's talk about um, de-escalating force, tear gas as a as a deterrent, as a non. Um, homicidal uh, use of force is still extremely aggressive. And if we are funding police forces here in Denver, across the state, across the nation, uh, the, the thought is, 
who are who are we funding these aggressive measures for? Uh, is it in the protection of property? Is it uh, uh, to be able to combat uh, peaceful protesters? Uh, sort of what what is the point here? And if the point is that we want to make better communities, then that money is better spent somewhere else. And so when we're thinking about reforming police departments. We've tried that. We've tried that a lot of different ways. Lots of these things don't work or they don't work um, in the ways that actually amount to protecting people's lives. Um, and speaking to uh, David's uh, metaphor earlier about uh, sort of deans and, and educators, uh, we're talking about kids getting expelled. We're, and when we're talking about police action, we're talking about people dying and the implicit idea that a lot of these folks are inherently guilty or that a cop can decide that guilt um, on the spot and decide that that person no longer gets to live in those situations. So um, in terms of what's happening in Colorado, what the legislation is. Um, I personally don't think it goes far enough, uh, especially because we've seen other measures get enacted across states and still um, not produce the outcome that we want. Penny, wrap it up for us. Your thoughts on the policy changes we've seen so far in Colorado. Well, once again, filming on Friday morning is a problem because the class action suit from four plaintiffs who had been at the protests went to federal court last Friday. Emergency hearing, Judge Brooke Jackson came out with that ruling that was very interesting, which noted that different law enforcement agencies that have been helping Denver were dealing with different use of force policies. So even if you like Denver's use of force policy, which has rules for using less lethal weapons, other people weren't obeying it. So he came down and said, everyone has to follow what Denver's rules are and Denver has to follow some rules I'm putting in. Interestingly, his ruling, which is only a temporary restraining order, wound up an, an amendment in this legislative act, which is clearly going to pass. And among other things, not only does it dictate that you should have body cameras, which some of the people in Denver didn't. Some of the law enforcement agencies working there just aren't equipped with them. Not only do you have to wear the body cameras, but you have to keep the tapes for 45 days. And as David points out, sometimes that's gonna show that the police officer was is being falsely accused. Sometimes, as in the case of George Floyd, it's going to show us that something truly horrible is going on. So we've seen some good changes so far. There are gonna be a lot more before we're done. Well, it's been a long week, but listen, we need a short take on this last one. The state legislature continues to tackle many proposals as the session begins to wane. This week, the state house approved a placing the Gallagher Amendment appeal on the ballot in November and a new immunization bill also passed the house after a testy committee hearing last Sunday. Meanwhile, House Bill 1420 titled the Tax Fairness Act passed the state house, but faces opposition from Governor Polis as it is currently written. Eric, your short take on all the activity we're seeing at the state capitol this week. Oh, it's a jump ball. So many angles. Who would have ever guessed that a vaccination bill would be this uh, controversial, uh, sort of the wacky right, the wacky left coming together? The angle I want to real quickly go after, Dominic, is a whole different bill. House Bill 1153 which passed, I, I believe, a week ago, is on its way to the governor. Collective bargaining rights for 28,000 state employees. I am not convinced what problem is out there that this one is designed to fix. It's a symptom of one-party government, Democrats running both houses of the legislature, obviously a Democratic governor. Stuff like this happens. But you know, we see the problem of police unions. We see the problem sometimes of teacher unions, which makes it very difficult to get rid of the least among them, the least competent uh, among them. I don't know why we are taking this step in state government, but it is happening. Lucille, let's go to you, uh, your quick take on everything we're seeing at the state capitol. Yeah, I mean, uh, we always have to sort of talk about things through the lens of COVID. And so uh, the same way that the last week of session were, you know, in May, we're used to all, all of this, the last minute things sort of going through all at once. Um, I definitely want to look to the immunization bill because I think it speaks to uh, sort of what we're all experiencing right now with states opening up and us thinking through what our collective responsibility is, what our individual responsibility is, and what that looks like in terms of individual freedom and choice. And so in this bill, we're still looking at people being able to, to be ex exempt, still being able to opt out, but really just making sure that Colorado is on par with the rest of the country. We're the lowest in terms of immunizations. And you know, when we're thinking about 
what, what the end of this pandemic looks like, a lot of people are looking to vaccines and what vaccine options uh, may look like. But if we don't have a plan for how we administer this and how um, uh, citizens of Colorado actually partake in this and how we make a society that's that's um, healthy for all of us. Uh, it'll be a really interesting rollout. And so uh, I, I'm in favor of the immunization, immunization bill personally, but I think we should all be thinking about what our role is there. Patty, your short take last week of the session, it's been crazy. It's always crazy at the end of a legislative session, but this might be the wackiest yet. And I'm sure we can guess that the legislators are going to approve to go alcohol from restaurants because they're going to need it after this. <laughs> David, wrap it up for us. Your thoughts on the waning session. Governor Polis has been a longtime advocate of uh, removing some special uh, tax breaks that, that certain businesses get and then using that increased revenue from that side to have an across the board tax cut uh, for everyone. And this, this House Bill 1420 is all of the punishment and none, none of the, the, the gain because uh, it, it raises business taxes by hundreds of millions of dollars and says no tax reduction uh, to balance that out. Um, and it's actually even even worse than that because it takes away uh, something from the, the federal tax reform law, the, the CARES Act passed by Congress in a bipartisan way because of the CCP virus epidemic. And the, this Bill 1420 uh, really punishes small small and medium businesses by taking away their ability to offset their losses this year uh, against income from, from other years. And it would also severely hurt farmers uh, by raising their, their fuel prices. So I'm glad Governor Polis uh, has been threatening to veto this. <laughs> well, let's get to our favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. We are in bumper sticker edition, folks. Keep it quick. Patty. The mess the tattered cover got itself in with its statement and then its apology. Just go read them and make your own decision. David. The New York Times for firing James Bennett, brother of Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, uh, as editor of the editorial page. The, the Times is now run by a, a management and, and staff that is uh, intellectually afraid uh, of diverse ideas or facts. Eric. I'll agree with David on that particular piece. Tucker Carlson, Fox News host, I wish I could go on about this, but he has played and flirted awfully closely with white supremacy for too long. I think he's finally been caught on that. Lucille. I think the disgrace that I'm going to look to is the 6-9 primaries. Uh, really a, a breakdown in, in lots of states here, but there are things that can be done, and we should look to those for November. Time to say something nice. Quickly, Patty. The artists who right now are doing a Black Lives Matter street mural on Broadway and also putting up murals protecting statues in Civic Center Park. Art for good cause. David. Colorado Senator Michael Bennett got 4,704 votes in the Georgia Democratic primary, presidential primary on Tuesday, and he came in seventh. And I'd say he would be a much better president than any of the candidates who finished ahead of him. Eric. A personal one, my wife Tracy retiring in the last week uh, after a wonderful late career job uh, at the Logan School in Denver. And Lucille. Companies all across the country really taking the, the protests as an opportunity to look internally at their uh, hiring processes and their company cultures. I want to remind all of you that we have the U.S. Senate Democratic primary debate right here on PBS 12 at 9 p.m. tonight part of our Colorado Science partnership with CBS4 and the Colorado Sun. Be sure to check it out. That's all the time we have for this episode of Colorado Inside Out. For everybody here at PBS 12, thank you so much for watching. Good night.